In the last two months, we have looked at the first two thirds of the Eric Debay Flat Earth documentary level, where he and his friends talk about the same old nonsense that we've seen and heard before with some snazzy effects thrown in. Well, today we take a look at the third and final part of his documentary, where we finish it off for good. Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Flat Earth Friday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Before we begin today, a quick thank you to the sponsors of today's video, Curiosity Stream. Now, Curiosity Stream is smart TV for your smart TV. They're the Netflix for nerds, the Hulu for history buffs, and the Disney Plus for the scientists among us, with award-winning exclusives and originals. Curiosity Stream has thousands of streamable documentaries and non-fiction TV shows on topics like history, nature, science, food, technology, travel, and more. Featuring 35 collections of curated programs, hand-picked by experts, and streaming to any device for viewing anytime, anywhere. Click on the link in the description and use my code SIMANDAN to sign up for $14.99 for a subscription for the whole year. Right, back to today's video where we are dissecting the final third of Eric DeBay's documentary. We catch up with him and his buddies when they start to mock channel friend Professor Dave. Ask any airline pilot what the shape of the earth is. When they're done laughing at you, they'll tell you it's a sphere. That's not, and that, yeah, no, the ground looks to us like it's standing still. Did you notice any curvature while we were up there? Uh, no. No? What'd, no. You, what'd you see while we were up there? Uh, this is the blue sky, white clouds. Yeah, is it flat or? Pretty flat. Pretty flat? Yeah. Okay. Now this is an odd one. No, you can't see the curvature of the Earth from a plane usually. However, pilots should know that everything they use and everything they do on a plane is because of and related to the fact that the Earth is a sphere. Additionally, the horizon is a product of Earth's curvature. So whilst you wouldn't see curve from left to right, you'd still see things appear from over the curve in front of you. Thank you. I was reading a lot of stuff on the flat Earth. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. True, true. That's true? Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, cool. All right. God bless, brother. Did you notice any curvature while we were up there? Curvature? No. No? There's no, no curvature? It's just all flat. Okay, so how are you, mate? Yeah, yeah. Pleased to meet you, guys. Yeah. There's no way there's curvature. We're around the flat, aren't we? Definitely. We are, aren't we? Well, Thank pancakes, you. Mate. <laughs> It looks like even pilots aren't immune to the Flat Earth YouTubers. Most pilots know their plane is flying over a plane. A stationary plane. Always a smooth and level flight. We never feel the plane dipping its nose down. We only feel the landing. Which flight route matches reality in your mind? If you chose the left, you may need medical attention. Everything beneath you while flying is level and motionless just as expected, flying over a stationary plane. Sometimes it's hard to see far ahead of you, but other times... We could probably see the Rockies from Kansas. Wow. Because it's a clear day, but if it's smoky or hazy, obviously we can't see much. The world is, is so generous in its beauty, and, and you do your best to, to take pictures of it. It's just, it's just flat and gorgeous. Silly act or not, you took the words right out of my mouth. Having recorded a few pilots that may or may not be flat earthers, that doesn't mean that most pilots know that the earth is flat. Most pilots, as Professor Dave said, would laugh at you. Earth is flat and gorgeous, but they trick you to believe something else. Not every pilot instantly connects the dots and keeps quiet. Sometimes it can hit them 25 years later. I find it very hard to believe that a true pilot with 25 years experience 
doesn't know how a gyroscope works. Better late than never. Most pilots may have skipped over their training manuals. In their flight dynamics summary, section 112 explains all you'll need to know about what you're flying over. Heck, the military knows the same thing. NASA admits it as well. In tons of documents available to the public, they just assumed nobody would pay attention. No, they just assumed that the people would understand that on all the documents you're showing here, the flat earth was mentioned as an assumption. Look, the word flat even has quote marks around it. This comes from the Army Research Laboratory. This one's from the CIA. There's another one from NASA. This report documents the definitions of linear aircraft model for the rigid aircraft of consistent mass flying over a flat, non-rotating Earth. This comes right from our own government. Now, I have available 44 documents. Who do I give them to, sir? Uh, you can go to the city clerk, please. Which is this person here. Yeah. So what I want is a law that's passed that we can't teach anything about the development. We have to teach the truth of how things are. This guy wants a law to teach Flat Earth. Good luck with that one. From the documents to the imagery, they are not flying around a curve heading to outer space. They are flying over a stationary flat plane. Stop falling for the illusions. Every rocket goes up and then levels out. Most of NASA's rockets launch from Florida and head towards the Bermuda Triangle. Well, besides the occasional... They're not shy about showing the truth in plain sight. 125 alleged miles up, and they show you our level horizon with a local sun. That doesn't look level to me. It actually looks convex. That tells you that the lens of the camera is skewing the image. Then quickly switch cameras to their fisheye lens, as if that didn't just happen. No, I think you know, Eric, that it was always a fisheye lens, and that it was constantly distorting the image. You have to pick one. You can't have both. Looks as if their cameras go about as high as most hot air balloons do before they burst. Who do they think they're fooling? But let me guess. You saw the curvature in the images from satellites. The thousands of magical orbiting aluminum tin cans floating in space. It's all animation and games until one comes crashing down on your squad. Many crashed satellites have been reported the world over. And the one thing they all have in common is giant helium balloons attached to them. Of course, satellite technology is real. We get our weather information, communication equipment, yeah, and even some more. internet service from them. Look up Google Loon, for example. It's not that they wouldn't use the magical floating satellites if they could. It's that they don't physically exist, nor does the globe. Weather balloons do exist, obviously, not refuting that one. But so do satellites. Here is a picture of one taken from the ISS. They have been sending these up one at a time since it all began. I will allow them to explain it. He got a patent on that in 1950. And those early balloons were so large, they didn't have any way to launch them, except they actually launched them from aircraft carriers. Modern scientific ballooning was born. It's also the genesis for NASA's newly developed super pressure balloon. The, whole, the reason for super pressure ballooning is they have absolutely stable altitude, day, night, and it doesn't matter if you how cold the atmosphere is, they are sealed. So your shape is always the same, you always displace the same amount of air, and therefore you have the same amount of buoyancy all the time. What is the point of this? No one is disputing the fact that we put up these sorts of balloons. What I do find confusing though, is that you absolutely believe NASA when they say they're putting up these types of balloons. No doubting that whatsoever. But when they say they've been to space and the moon, then they're all liars. This day to night altitude stability allows super pressure balloons and the sun. Hi, I'm Matt and this is NASA Now. NASA's been using balloons for science research for over 30 years. 
the exploration that can be done on balloons is continuing to grow. Standard balloon that I fly is about 660 feet long when it's made. So when it's inflated, it's over 400 feet tall by 440 feet wide. Think of a dome stadium. That's how big my balloons are. So let me get this straight. It is now public knowledge that they send up satellites on massive helium-filled balloons. Yes, and as I said, no doubting NASA about this, is there? As you should know, NASA is the largest consumer of helium in the world, for obvious reasons. But the issue with society is that they never critically think. Just think for a second here. If these are sent up to provide the world with all of the important information we need, and I'm sure the entire process is expensive and difficult to accomplish, then please explain to me what in the flat world do these pathetic animations do for you? Do they make you happy inside? Are they so super duper cool that you cannot see past the obvious CGI? The fact of the matter is everything NASA sends up on a balloon simply hovers above our motionless Earth. That is why they rarely speak about orbiting satellites. And of course, they never show footage. No, no, they never show footage. Never show any footage at all. Here is some footage of a random evening with a man, the moon, and his Nikon P900. Notice anything floating up there? So, who cares, Eric? No one is denying that these balloons exist. It's like me trying to prove that there's no sharks in the ocean by constantly showing you pictures of whales. Forget it, Bart. It's so bright out you can't see anything in the sky except the Fox satellite. Another remarkable fact about NASA's balloon launches is that many are launched from Antarctica. Is it because we cannot travel past certain parallels to witness their launches with our own eyes? No, you can't witness all of the launches, but they release a video for you all to see. Standard. What else are they hiding from us over there? It would be nice if someone was allowed to truly explore Antarctica again. It sure has been a while since the last guy. Greetings to you, my young friend. Our very distinguished guest for this evening is Admiral Richard E. Byrd. I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, is there any unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. Strangely enough, there is left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. What does this prove? Bird saw a small portion of Antarctica. He knew there was a massive amount of it left to explore. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. But more important than that, it's, uh, it has to do with the future uh, of the nation, for those to come after us, or even uh, during our lifetime. Because it happens to be an untouched reservoir of natural resources. That's never been seen by a human being. Ah, it's Flat Earth Millionaire. He owes me $200,000. Since late 2014, one of the biggest things I've heard, the Earth is flat. Why don't you find the edge and fall off? Why don't you make up an expedition and gather people and go find the edge and take a picture of the edge? Well, my response is, can you fall off the edge of a lake, a pond? Yes. An ocean. Let's see if you have any imagination left in that brain of yours. And pretend this is all the water in the world. This is the 71% covered earth filled pond. All the water of the world. So let's just say this is trillions upon trillions upon trillions of gallons. You've got the continents, the islands in the middle, in the center where all compasses point. You can circumnavigate, circle the lake or the pond left or right. But as you venture outwards towards the banks, towards outer space, what happens? Once you pass that 60th degree parallel, 
and you hit the ice wall, the ice cliff of Antarctica, what happens? Do you fall off the edge? Is there an edge here? Is there an edge here? So what are you saying? That this ice wall is infinite? Because we know the physics of water is defined and maintained level if you've been paying attention. And also water must be contained. It is contained. We climb up the banks and we keep going outward, southward. What happens to their control when millions of people travel beyond the 60th parallel? They knew this was going to get out. They knew people were going to wake up. What if Star Wars is true? What if this extra terrestrial, these extra terrains, they're telling us the truth minus the vacuum of space because they got to put a Hollywood spin on it, don't they? Star Wars, Star Trek, what if you Globers can have your Star Wars and your Star Trek at the same time? Isn't that awesome? That'd be awesome, yes. How's that make you feel? The timeline goes as follows. So in 1955, Operation Deep Freeze starts. And when Admiral Richard Byrd gets back, he comes on live television and tells us he found more land the size of North America. They quickly start NASA. President Eisenhower calls over the Nazi traitors in Operation Paperclip to start the upper space mind control program. Don't look out there. Look up here. Look, everybody. We're going to the moon. Then, in 1959, 12 nations started the Antarctic Treaty, followed by 42 more nations where they have decided you or I cannot travel or explore any part of Antarctica south or past the 60th parallel without military clearance, without the aid of a guided tour. Do you really think that this is just a coincidence? No. Okay, matey, how about you go and explore Antarctica without a guided tour or without the military? You won't be coming back. It's all to do with safety. Imagine they find more land. Imagine there is more, more land out there. More to explore, more to reside, more resources. You think, um, you think they tell you and I about it? I'm sure a lot of you have heard about my $200,000 globe challenge. Yeah, I won that. And up to this point, no one has been successful at completing the challenge. Oh, that is bullshit. We've had a few clowns here and there that have stepped up to the plate. Here we go. And uh, claimed victory. That was me. I'm famous. But at the end of the day, you can't make water stick to the bottom of a ball, much less spinning. Okay. You can't show where sea level turns to sea curve. There's no curvature on the X axis or Y axis. That stuff is flat. Here's a fair challenge here for Neil deGrasse Tyson. Why don't you get off your fat, lazy butt and out from behind your screens and your scripts? Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning. And it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So Earth got a little bit wider at its equator than it did pole to pole. So, so you spin, you know, when you spin pizza dough, it kind of flattens out. Like spinning pizza dough. Yeah. You know, it just gets but flat. If you were a cosmic giant and you came up to Earth and you rubbed your finger over Earth's surface, it would feel as smooth as a cue ball to you. Wow. If you shrunk Earth down to the size of a cue ball, yeah. it would be one of the smoothest, roundest cue balls ever made. Not sure where they're going with this. That's how round Earth is. So it's not actually a sphere, it's an it's oblate. It's like pear shape. Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's funny, six years ago, I, I sent a whole bunch of questions for you to answer. Um, and. Uh, I notice you haven't answered them. That's because you're Dave Murphy, a flat earther who drinks wee wee. You're not a scientist. You're an actor with a, with a couple of science degrees. There's people with uh, those same qualifications flipping burgers in Burger King. Well, it's like is there? Well, even if there was, why is that a problem? At least they'd be working. Burger flipping is obviously beneath Dave. The funny thing is though, that even the lowly burger flipper thinks the Earth is a globe. So, yeah. <laughs> so you don't impress me. You disgrace, Tyson. You are a lying Jesuit thug and a deceiver. You are a degenerate from Good luck to all your lying when you're down in doing favors for And remember my name when you're in there, Santos Bonacci. Hey Neil, you talk about Paris so much. Why don't you try eating a few, you fat f Charming. What a real scientific documentary this has turned out to be. 
That's actually good. Hey, Neil. If the level in Motionless Plane is so easily debunked, so easily refuted, then why don't you just debate Eric Dubé? Why don't you get off your fat, lazy butt out from behind your screens and your scripts? And debate Eric Dubé. <laughs> Good one. Eric doesn't debate. Eric, how many times has MC Toon offered to debate you? And how many times have you completely ignored that request? You've heard the name Eric Dubé, but you're scared, you're chicken You won't debate Eric Dubé because you don't have a script and lines and people telling you what to say. You know you'll get demolished. Why don't you just come on a podcast or any type of show, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe an hour, if you've got the and debate Eric Dubé. I'm sure Neil feels a similar way to me about this. He doesn't debate established fact. However, I will say this, Eric, you can debate MC Toon live on this channel with the potential for a huge audience. Come on, Eric, you've got your mates to goad Neil deGrasse Tyson into a debate. Why don't you step into this arena and show us all what you've got? Of course, it'll all be variations from this shoddy documentary, so I guess you won't be accepting. Email me, Eric. Let's set this one up. Flat. See how much of a man you are there, Mr. Mike Drop. Looks like we're gonna have Eric Dubé, he said he's agreed to do it, talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson. What? Yes. <laughs> I had asked you to debate one of them flat earth guys. No, I don't, I can't, I, no, no. I know. <laughs> we talked about it and we were gonna have him on Skype. No, what we do is, and I think this is a diabolical plot, so that the next time we can ship people en masse into orbit, they all want to be the first in line because they know we're gonna send them so that they can see the round earth. They're gonna be the first ones in space. Just so they can stop annoying the rest of us. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you're correct. And I know that you're not correct. Why the backpedaling, Neil? You already agreed to debate me on Joe Rogan's podcast. The show was scheduled, posted on Joe's site, announced on air twice, and then you suddenly decided that you, quote, don't debate flat earthers. Ah, man after my own heart. And why would you? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Someone at NASA told Neil, we're not going to let you go head to head with Eric Dubé because he'll make you look foolish. <laughs> of course you did, Eric. How can you record this audio, Eric, when your head is shoved halfway up your bum? Prove me wrong. Yes, you'd like that, Eric, wouldn't you? Well, I think you're too scared to debate MC Toon. It can't be that hard, Eric. You were willing to make Neil deGrasse Tyson look like a fool, weren't you? MC Toon should be easy compared to that, shouldn't he? Come on, Eric, prove me wrong. Well, there we go, Eric DeBay's Flat Earth documentary level completely debunked from start to finish. Please, please do like the video. Uh, as I said in the first video, I'd like to have these three videos visible and available before anyone even sees the actual original documentary. 50,000 likes and we'll really step up this campaign to get Eric to debate MC Toon live on this channel. Thank you all so much for watching. Please, please do subscribe if you haven't done so already. It'd be truly appreciated. Just enough time to once again thank Curiosity Stream for sponsoring today's video. Remember, click on the link in the description and put in my code SIMANDAN and you can get Curiosity Stream for an entire year for only $14.99. I have been Simon Dan, have yourselves a great weekend and I'll see you all on Tuesday for a brand new collab. See you then. <laughs>